My name is Father David Kelly from Precious Blood Ministry of Reconciliation, and we would like to welcome you to this, our second panel discussion on what we're calling Conversations That Matter. Hopefully you are with us last Monday when we heard four individuals speak of their experiences of decades of incarceration and how it was coming home after that many years away. If you missed that, you can tune, get it on our website, um, which has the full panel discussion. But tonight, we welcome mothers and grandmothers who have been deeply impacted by violence. Of course, these are their stories, and we have the privilege of hearing from them and hopefully learning from them. This panel discussion will be moderated by our own Sister Donna. Hopefully, as we hear these mothers and grandmothers, we can begin to work together to end violence, and promote healing, and restorative justice. I take leave this evening with these words from Fania Davis, an author and civil rights lawyer. Justice is a healing ground, not a battleground. Now let me turn things over to, to Sister Dot. Well, good evening again, and yes, I am Sister Donna, and I just thank you for welcoming us into your home, into your office, perhaps you're still at work, or maybe in your car, wherever you may be tonight on this lovely fall evening. So tonight, uh, yes, we have conversations that truly matter. We have four amazing women, women who've walked in shoes that no one would want to have to walk in, and they are truly going to offer us conversations that matter conversations that are powerful, some conversations that will challenge us to walk, not in their shoes, but walk with them in hope and healing. So these women need to be heard. They have walked through loss, grief, racism, poverty perhaps, but they've walked with courage. They've walked with resilience. They've walked with faith and with love. They also represent about 100 women that we work with in Families Forward. And so tonight we are going to do um, a circle. We often sit together in healing circles, in hope circles. And so we will use that same process tonight. So I'm going to ask Lisa to chime us in. After a chime in, we usually use a prayer or a poem. And tonight we're going to use the poem, A Pair of Shoes, because as I said before, these women have walked in shoes that none of us want to walk in. <clears throat> and on our table right here, we have many symbols, and one of them is a pair of shoes. And one of our mothers, her own son, was wearing these shoes when his life was taken. So the poem is so powerful to all of us about wearing a pair of shoes. So I'll ask Aldina to start our poem. I am wearing a pair of shoes. They are ugly shoes, uncomfortable shoes. I hate my shoes. Each day I wear them and each day I wish I had another pair. Some days my shoes hurt so bad that I don't think I can take another step. Yet I continue to wear them I get funny looks wearing these shoes. They are looks of sympathy. I can tell in others' eyes that they are glad they are my shoes and not theirs. To learn how awful my shoes are might make them uncomfortable. To truly understand these shoes, you must walk in them. But once you put them on, you can never take them off. I now realize that I am not the only one who wears these shoes. There are many pairs in this world. Some women are like me and ache daily as they try to walk in them. Some have learned how to walk in them so they don't hurt quite as much. Some have worn the shoes so long that days will go by before they even think about how much they hurt. No woman deserves to wear these shoes. Yet, because of these shoes, I am a stronger woman. These shoes have given me the strength to face anything. They have made me who I am. I will forever walk in these shoes of a woman who has lost a child. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd ask you then to check in if you would say your name and how you come to this circle this evening. 
And what shoes have you walked in? So would uh, anyone like to start that? My name is Aldina Brown. I'm actually excited and honored to be here. Um, I will say the shoes that I walk in would be, um, I guess, kind of like sadness, having to raise five boys and two girls, and then five boys in um, Inglewood's kind of rough, you know, so I've made it, you know, they're adults now, but it's, it's, never, it's still never easy, even though they are adults. So I would say kind of sadness. Hi, I'm Lisa Daniels. Um, I'm here tonight. I am grateful. Um, this, that's how I come to this space tonight. And the shoes that I walk in are those of a woman who uh, lost her youngest son, who was 25 years old at the time, to a single criminal act of violence. Uh, I also wear the shoes of a woman who has found life beyond the pain and grief of that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are my shoes. Thank you. I'm Julie Anderson, and I come to the circle um, very humbled to be with these women, actually. Um, my shoes are the shoes of a, uh, my son at 15 years old was um, incarcerated. Um, for a homicide and he is, that was 26 years ago and he's still currently incarcerated. So I lost my son to incarceration. Good evening. My name is Lisa Villanueva and um, I come here today um, grateful as well that uh, I've met um, Sister Donna and these lovely ladies here on the panel. And I, my shoes that I walk and is um, I lost my daughter um, 10 months ago to gun violence and she was only 19 years old. And I struggle every day. Her picture is here on our table. So thank you, all of you. Um, a question I'd like to ask of each of you would be, you know, what impact did wearing these shoes or this act of violence against one of your children or living in this community where there's so much violence, uh, how has that impacted you? And Lisa Daniels, I think I'll start with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sister Donna. Um, it's impacted, there, there were many ways that, that I was impacted by Darren's loss. Uh, first of all, um, it's, the very first thing that I experienced, I think that, that was very, very impactful was uh, the experience of judgment. Um, Darren's murder uh, was the result of a robbery uh, where, in wherein he was the perpetrator. Um, the incident uh, involved a drug deal that uh, that was, dis I'm sorry, I always say that wrong. It was a robbery that was actually disguised as a drug deal. And at the end of the day, when the dust was settled uh, and the streets were clear, there were, uh, there was no gun and there, I'm sorry, there was no money and there was no gun, no, no drugs found at the scene. Um, and I had never lost a child before. Um, I had no, I had no idea what to expect. And um, the most, the, the first thing that I experienced was the judgment um, that came the very next day in the form of a newspaper article, <clears throat> excuse me, that was printed in the Daily South Town regarding the incident that took, par took place in Park Forest. And it, uh, it led with the headline that said, Park Forest man shot to death had drug and felony convictions. And my child, was not identified by his name until the second paragraph of that article. So he was dehumanized in one sentence as a result of one act of, that took place uh, and his, his entire 25 years was uh, surmised uh, or defined by that one act. Um, and that impacted me, that impacted me greatly. 
um, I try to reach out to support uh, services for grief support. And uh, I was challenged at every at every turn simply because of the uh, circumstances surrounding Darren's murder. Um, I did not find a judgment free zone until I found PBMR. Um, and so I thank you for that. I thank you for the work that you've done here. Um, I, uh, another way I think uh, of the many ways, I, and because there are other people here on the panel that have stories to tell, so uh, I, I cannot, uh, I, 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 there, there are so many layers of, of, of impact um, as a result of this experience. But one of the things that I think um, was most impactful for me was losing Darren in that way um, turned me into a truth teller, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, I had to be honest and forthright about how he died and be able to separate how he died from who he was in order to, uh, to show his humanity mm -hmm. to a world that would choose to see him as something less than a human being. And so from that point to today, I have taken every opportunity that I, that I am afforded to tell the truth about his experience and um, how that has uh, afforded me the opportunity to be uh, a valuable voice um, for the humanity of others. In, in, in similar situations. I think even the person who took his life, uh, you also respect him as a human being. Absolutely, absolutely. His name is Michael Reed. And I, I speak his name intentionally because he is also a human being. And I was given that opportunity to actually speak on his behalf at his, uh, his sentencing hearing when he was convicted of Darren's murder. Um, and um, in that space, I think it was important for me to do so because I had spent so much time saying, hey, mm -mm, my son was a human being and it's unfair to judge him by his worst act. And I would not be a, a hypocrite um, or I say I would have been a hypocrite uh, to not actually give Michael Reed that same opportunity to be human and to uh, say that his life uh, is deserving of a second opportunity as well. There's still life left in him. Darren is gone and he will never return, but there is still life left in this young man. And um, neither of them should have to have paid as dearly as they did for making the worst decisions of their life that day. Um, so, yeah, the voice that I had been given as a result of my son's murder, the platform that I had been given as a result of his murder, um, what better place to use it um, than for the, the young man who was convicted of his murder. Um, and it worked out pretty well for him. Um, in asking that day, um, I asked the judge to show leniency. And so a plea agreement that was uh, initially uh, 15 years second degree murder um, because of judicial discretion. The judge uh, changed that to 50%, uh, which gave him seven and a half years, mm -hmm. four years credit for time served in, uh, in, uh, as, uh, in pretrial. And um, he ended up serving actually just under three years because of good time credit that he received. And I'm, I'm so happy to say um, that Michael Reed is, uh, has completed parole. And um, my hope and my prayer is that he uh, has taken full advantage of the opportunity that he has left. I think he's like 31 years old at this point. And my hope and my prayer is that he is, um, he is utilizing this opportunity and becoming uh, the best that he could possibly be with the second chance that he's been given. 
Thank you. I remember when I met you, I said, you have a mission, remember? I do you remember that. that mission. I do remember that. I almost <laughs> fell out of my chair when you said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. you speak true words. Thank you. Yeah. So Julie, you have kind of a different experience. Uh, would you be willing to share the shoes you've walked in these 20 some years? Yeah, 20, almost 26 years, actually. Um, my son, Eric, um, you know, he's 15 year old, uh, impulsive and very, very smart. Um, and you know, he just got involved with things that kind of spun out of control. He shot across the park and two girls were murdered. He had six co-defendants with him. Eric was the youngest at the age of 15. The oldest was 23. Um, and for that he received, um, life without any possibility of parole. I had not known a sentence like that could even exist. Um, and the idea that a 15 year old, he was 15 on the day this happened. And the next day, less than 24 hours later, he was an adult because he was charged automatically as an adult and went into adult court. He had no idea what was going on. We had no idea what was going on. Um, and at that moment, I would have told you, um, I do have two other children, but I would have told you that ruined my life. It destroyed me and it destroyed my family. I didn't know where to go. And I have to say that, um, you know, after 26 years, uh, just at the time I prayed that I would see a way that his life in the girls lives wouldn't be wasted and wouldn't be there, there would be a reason and God would show me a path that would show like there had to be something that could come out of this. And I, I have to say that God did lead me to a path that I didn't necessarily want to take, but um, I had never thought about anyone being in prison. I really didn't think anything about our prison system because it didn't affect me. And I'm many times ashamed to say that it never touched me. Prisoners, people in prison, I, I knew where Stateville was because it's close to Chicago and I can remember driving by there and thinking, geez, what an awful place that must be, but not really understanding the harshness of it and what a really awful place it is and what we do in this country to people. Um, worst mistake of his life, um, he is, he certainly wasn't that person even at 15. He was willful, but it, he is now 41 and he certainly changed in, in, and he's certainly not the same person. And because of him and visiting him, because um, my husband and I have visited him, you know, for 26 years, every visit we could get. He was in Menard, 360 miles away, seven times a month, we were able to visit him. And um, I was able to meet many other people who were sentenced to this same thing of juvenile life without parole, as we call it. And these were people that we shouldn't be throwing away. And I, I, I came to love all of them, which then became my mission in life is twofold to try to reduce our sentences. Uh, Eric is was very lucky on 2012. Um, the US Supreme Court said it was cruel and unusual punishment to sentence anyone under the age of 18 to a mandatory life sentence. He was resentenced in 2017 to 30 years. So he will be out in April of 2025. Um, and for 22 years, I lived with the thought that he would die in prison. And everything in my life was tainted by the idea that he would die there. He would never, nothing I did could ever change it. Nothing he did, no matter what kind of person he became. So now my mission is to try to reduce those harsh sentences. People absolutely need to be held accountable for their actions. I would never say they don't. Um, and also to try to change some of the conditions in our prison. I, I just am horrified at the way we treat our very own people, our very own citizens. Thank you, Julie. I know both of you have so much more to say, but <laughs> but you know you both have taken upon you know something so horrible that happened in your life, and yet you have done such wonderful work in the community to be restoring justice instead of being punitive. So thank you.
and Lisa, you also have some shoes to walk in and have done it so beautifully. Yes, um, <clears throat> Sister Donna. So um, my story involved my shoes that I walk in is that I lost my daughter 10 months ago, December 19th, 2020. So that was the worst year of my life, mm -hmm. even with the pandemic and still the pandemic is going on. And we thought, man, the pandemic was something and still is. But when I got that call that my daughter was, you know, dead and she was shot in the head and, you know, by her friend that she only knew two months and he took his life after afterwards. I said, this can't be happening to me. I mean, what have I done? What have I done to deserve this? And, um, no, her name was Abigail Perez and, and, um, she was a beautiful, young lady starting to live her life and going to college and things. And she just met this boy. He wasn't her boyfriend or anything, but he wanted more than what she wanted. And, um, and that was it. He just, just took my daughter from one day to the next. It just, it's devastating. Um, you know, I, I'm, she was the middle child, so I have an oldest daughter and a younger son. So, of course, I wanted to just die. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was so hard for me, but I'm grateful that I was able to meet other mothers. It's for sister that, and it's just so hard to talk here today, but I know I have to be brave and strong for their mothers. That is happening, the same thing. This gun violence is crazy. And the way that she was taken is what hurts me the most. Is he took her life, like shot her like she was an animal. And it's, I always thought that she would be maybe hurt in, the, in a crossfire or kidnapped her but this way i never thought about the way that she was taken and the thing that really hurts is that people they made it out to be a love suicide and it wasn't a love suicide or triangle but they tried to put it as um my daughter didn't love him because i would have known that she would have told me it was just a friend that she had met and yes, they did, you know, talk and, and went out, but it wasn't that serious. And I just feel like now I have a, a like a mission. I need to educate other mothers for their daughters or sons that, you know, toxic, toxic relationships is serious. It's not a joke. And any little thing that I just didn't, See, at the time, I thought it was him wanting to buy her, you know, just like buy her love and thought it was going to be okay, but I didn't really think of it, you know, and wanted to, you know, I mean, it just, that was something that I regret and I feel guilty every day. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad that I'm here today to speak about Abby with, with everyone here. Mm -hmm. Well, we're glad you're here too and you have taken up your mission and you have your own other children too to yes my other children my impact. grandchildren that you know their lives are changed we you know holidays are not going to be the same nothing will be the same ever again and yes i you know you what justice i don't have any justice because he took his own life um but i just pray that one day i can forgive him but right now we can't. That's my story. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. <clears throat> Powerful story. Can I just say that? Um, sorry. <laughs> it's so hard. Um, that 
when this first happened to me, I, I, I hate to say even as a mother, but I often thought, and I often people are like, oh, well, you, know, you can visit your son, but I, I had this like guilt and shame, and it was just overwhelming at times that, you know, my son was the offender. He was the person who caused harm, and, and, you know, if I was on the other side, it wouldn't feel that way. And after talking to mothers, like when you learn, and I realized that they also had all that guilt and shame, which they shouldn't have, but both of you have said that exact same thing. And it's like, it's, as a mom, we wear it all, right? Oh, yes. It's just like the things that you should have, could have yeah. maybe changed or that day, if it would have changed different, you know, but the Lord has a reason. And I guess that was to take my daughter to do better and bigger things up in heaven. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for saying that too. Well, Dean, I wanted to just address the issue. How is it in this community to raise children and grandchildren when there's so much violence and racism and lack of support? Well, I can say I've been blessed. I haven't lost any of my children. I've basically had to deal with incarceration after incarceration. My boys started going to juvie as young as 12. We started at 12, it's from the oldest to the last, the third from the youngest. Um, I had one son, he was uh, 17. He did an aggravated armed robbery. They gave my son um, 17 years at 17 years old. He's home now. You know, he did nine and a half years. He's home. All my other boys, they have managed to stay out of jail. I thank God for that. But I can say I had help. You know, my mom, rest in peace, she passed away though. But my, I can say I'm, I'm just blessed. My boys are, I guess, trying to find their own path, but living in Inglewood and the type of influence that certain people and things have on the children, you feel like you like tugging, mm -hmm. like you pulling one way and they pulling the other way. So basically what I do now is pray. And I, I honestly, I pray so hard for not just mine, but for everybody, it's, it's not easy. It's not. So that's my story. I just deal with a lot of incarceration and just trying to do the best I can as they mother. You do. I thank each of you for just sharing that. I know you have so much more to say, but I would like to also ask the audience, those who are listening to these powerful stories, these conversations that truly matter, if you have questions of any of these women, these mothers, these grandmothers, uh, please bring those forth on the Q&A or in the chat room, and uh, we will try to answer those. Um, but I'd also like to pose a few more questions like each any one of you who would like to say, you know, what has been the challenges of having a son incarcerated or having a son or a daughter's life taken so brutally? Um, and I ask any one of you who would like to start that conversation, uh, what has been the, what's really challenging in your life or in your community? <laughs> I could <laughs> say, <laughs> yeah, no, I feel like or just the challenge begin? of walking in these yes, shoes. The seriously. judgment, which yeah. is what Lisa mentioned, yeah. being judged. And for me, a lot of times, and all the moms will understand this, is um, I love my son. And I, he's not a horrible monster. He did a bad thing. But many people have you know my friends are still my friends and a lot of my family of course they're still there kind of but they all judge eric and they're all like well you know we know anyone could have a bad kid or you know and, and he gets labels and and maybe they don't judge me as a mom i always kind of think they might because in the united states we like to judge people's mothering skills or lack of them continuously mm -hmm. you know they don't crawl soon enough they 
take the bottle too long, whatever they do, you know, we're always Anything. doing the judging. Yeah. <laughs> so like so many of them still judge Eric and it's like, he did this to me almost. And of course, you know, there's, there's some two beautiful girls are gone and there's a lot more than me. And it just is, it's, it's really hard a lot of times to be, to have him judged, like, like they forgive me, but they're not going to forgive him type of thing, you know, and mm -hmm. that's, that's probably as a mother, that's really difficult, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think for me, um, the, it's been uh, the assumption of resilience, because I am a woman of color, um, that the, the support that I thought I should have gotten, um, and I, again, couldn't even tell you what, what, it, what it could have looked like. Um, but what I know is that there were just many, many places, even in the days and weeks uh, following Darren's murder, that I was by myself. Um, and I believe I've learned as a result of a lot of the work that I've uh, embarked upon um, through the organization that I founded, is that there's just this assumption that women of color are, uh, have this level of resilience and that they'll be okay. You know, that the, the strong black woman syndrome um, is, is, is a lie um, because I'm, I'm simply a human being and uh, the color of my skin nor the experiences that I've had um, as a woman of color make me exempt from the grief and the shame and mm. the judgment and the need for support um, that exist uh, in, in a scenario of losing a child, particularly a child uh, who was the perpetrator in, in his own experience. Um, I don't need to be judged. I need to be supported. I've heard the same thing. It's, well, yeah. you had to have done something wrong. Well, where was his father? Well, how was, yeah. you know, all of these questions of me and you ask me questions or I've been asked questions um, that relate, that could possibly relate to how I failed in this scenario before you ask me how I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, Perfect. that's that's been one of my one of my challenges. One of my biggest challenges mm -hmm. is that assumption that, you know, she'll be all right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think, Aldina, we were talking about earlier this evening of how it is as an, uh, a woman of color um, and how sometimes you're uh, looked upon as strong women when you're just hurting so much? Yeah. Um, then me having um, my children so young and kind of fast and um, basically having to raise them on my own. Like I said, I had help and once my mom died, I really had to step up. But being like the, to blame for certain things that my children did, that's what I had a problem with. And for a long time, I did, th did think it was my fault. But after a while, I had to realize, you know, you do certain things, you, it's a mistake, maybe once, maybe even twice. But I realized they were choosing to do these things. So what people at, a, at one point thought about me for ne probably never, some had children, some didn't have children, but everybody don't raise their children the same. And I decided not to raise mine according to how everybody else think they should be raised. But I love my boys and I have faith in them that one day they will get on the straight and narrow and do good, be productive citizens one day. It's not too late, they're all still young. Mm -hmm. And they're already moving forward. That's right. Mm -hmm. We have some questions from the audience. Um, 
One question here is how important has it been to meet other mothers who have experienced similar loss, similar loss? Uh, Kevin has asked that question. Would any one of you like to address that, Lisa? Um, it was really, uh, it's very important. I think that there's different scenarios of how your child is lost or gets taken away. Um, and I would like, oh, you know, my child, um, if she was like on a bus stop or something like that and, and gets shot and then, then you meet another parent that has the same exact thing and she's grieving, but you didn't think about it at the time and you would say, you know, oh, what if, you know, I'd rather my daughter got shot that way or, or like in a, in a crossfire, but I believe anyway is, is devastating. Um, and the support, I just understanding, like listening to other parents mothers and, and fathers that have, it's really a great support that's needed. I hope I, I answered the question you correctly. Fine. I'm trying to do my best here. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think important one here uh, for some of you who've been very much a part of the justice system, how has your understanding of justice changed since your children were affected and how we can create a justice in our legal, create justice in our legal system, ask Christina. Wow, <laughs> I will it's say a big question. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a really um, big question, and I don't think there's uh, a one answer for that. No, no, there's no, no there answer. really isn't, and it's it's so adversarial from the start. And of course, there's a lot of harm done and a lot of emotions in there. And you know, my husband um, was a police officer, and I thought the justice system worked really well. I'll be honest. I really, I thought we had the best in the world. And I've heard many people say that. And I um, actually traveled to Europe and found out we don't have the best in the world. And it was, I, I really did believe that. And I, I think a lot of people do who've never, who've never come in contact with exactly. it. Yeah. They, they really, have never walked in those shoes. Exactly. Yeah, they exactly. think it yeah. works and it's it's really Until a big problem. It yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it doesn't yeah. work for anyone, hardly. Yeah. I mean, on whatever side you grieve on. It's no. definitely punitive. Mm -hmm. it, it is definitely punitive. There's nothing restorative about it. There's right. nothing supportive uh, about it. And there's the, the, the unfortunate thing is that the, it is designed for uh, it is mm -hmm. designed as a one size fits all uh, yeah. approach mm -hmm. yeah. that, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a one size fits all approach. Yeah, it's like, you know, you don't know what to think. You know, one day you just get that call and say your child is gone and you don't hear from them for quite a while. And then it's just like, okay, so what now? You're calling and calling the officer or the detective that, you know, was on scene or whatever. It's like, and then he doesn't answer your phone and then you get the advocate that's supposed to be calling you to make sure that the, the officer is calling you and then they don't call you anymore. You're just like left there alone and like what's going on. And then that's why I'm glad I reached out to um, PPMR because now I know it's just a waiting game. It's a waiting game, but you get tired of waiting. You want answers. Mm -hmm. What happened? What what? what actually happened that day. I have a question here, Lisa. What helped you recognize the humanity of Michael Reed? Can you share a little bit more about that, Christy asked? What helped me recognize the humanity of, of Michael Reed? It, it wasn't hard to, to see that he was a human being and that he had needs just like my son did. Um, I think it was helpful uh, or, or what, what I could say uh, was helpful was the fact that um, Darren was a human being and he was being dehumanized by his worst act um, as a result of the, uh, the uh, media. And um, that uh, said to me that um, if I needed or wanted um, people to see Darren as a human being, 
I had to be willing to see the same humanity in the man that took his life. Mm -hmm. And that experience uh, in and of itself actually changed the trajectory of my entire life. It, it changed um, the way I think, it changed the landscape, meaning um, everything around me, the people that I am in relationship with, uh, the work that I do for a living, it changed everything, that, that one experience. And so I guess um, aside from the fact, again, that, that he, he was simply a human being, and it's, 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 it's so tragic that we choose to see people based on the things that they've done versus, versus the, the fact that they, that they stand in a body. Um, it, 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 if I had to pinpoint, it would be because I, I need, I wanted people to see my son as a human being. I didn't want him to be judged for the thing that he had done. I hope that helps. I see we have a question too. How could those listening, how could they really support your organization, your individual missions? You all really have a mission. Even Aldina, I see you as a mission in this community. <clears throat> to work against the violence and be a voice. You have been doing that. Yeah. And uh, so any one of you would like to say, how could the listing group, what would you like to say to them about your individual call in this community as, as a result of the shoes you walked in? I know as, as for me, it would be that um, at one point I thought my boys would never get out in the streets, rob, steal, breaking houses. I never thought that. I was one of those moms that was like, my kids know better. They'll never do that. But when my son started going to jail, I had to realize my children are not above nothing that possibly could happen out here. Now with um, coming to, um, Precious blood made me realize that, you know, they, there's hope. All these boys, they actually, I love them. They all have potential. It's just the point of getting them to, them to see it, you know, or get maybe the right, um, more resources, I would say, is needed in this area for not only the boys, but the young ladies too. I would say it would be more resources mm -hmm. More resources in our community in the community yeah mm -hmm. definitely i see yeah. that too mm -hmm. yeah julie i see carlin has a question <laughs> for you <laughs> i'm sure you can read it yeah are you reading that or? it says as a white woman carlin asks, how have you seen inequity in this type of loss of grief in inequality inequality inequality, no, inequality. i'm sorry uh, yeah completely different. well how have I not seen it? No, how have you seen uh, it? No, but I mean, I've seen it everywhere and that's all, that's every great. aspect of it. Yeah, and great. when I first um, came to Sister Donna's circle, and I'm just going to be honest here with everyone. Uh, I'm a Southsider, born and bred, and I don't do kumbaya or anything like that. <laughs> so I went to this circle. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and thought I, you know, and I saw what they did to Eric and there was no justice. There was no, this is happening. And I would hear these moms and almost all of them are black mothers or grandmothers mm -hmm. and they'd pour their hearts out and their kids were in juvie and they were up against some serious charges. And I, my heart would break for them because I would think, oh man, your kid doesn't stand a chance. I go sit in Cook County court building case after case after case of the mothers that I know whose kids are fighting cases. And I can tell you, everyone brought through in handcuffs is black or brown. And the people who aren't in handcuffs, the white people are sitting out with us. I mean, my son didn't get bail, he, but he's, he's the exception rather mm -hmm. than the rule. So they have a better defense and they're walking in front of a judge not in a prison uniform to start with. And all you need to do is go to Cook County and watch that revolving door. And then when you go and visit prison, that's another whole story of go down to Menard, which I think that's in the very southern tip of mm -hmm. Illinois. Mm -hmm. Super 
they're super racist down there. That's all you can say. And I get a certain level of, um, they can let this go. They can look the other way. Um, you know, maybe my shirt is maybe deemed okay. Um, but a lot of judgment on the way people dress women, especially, and a lot of calling them out on that in front of groups. So it's, it's every single thing that across the board. And I don't think I knew that either till I was involved in it. I hate to say that I sound like such a, like, like living in a cocoon, but yeah, Yeah. no, but you haven't really. (laughs) Well, not for 26 years. (laughs) Right. And there's just an affirmation there. Julie and Eric's story says change my life. You could read it. And I think any of you four women and the hundreds of women that hear our family forward have definitely changed my life. And I think that as we hear more of these stories and conversations that matter, that lives will be changed and stories need to be heard and voices need to be heard. So uh, we don't have a lot of time left yet, but I'd like to ask each of you to say, what would you like to leave with the audience and those who have been listening tonight Uh, what would you like to leave with them or or ask them or or say i hope that you left with this message that i want to tell you you know i um one of the things that um, i've had uh, the opportunity to experience um or in the past few years is uh, having been appointed by uh, governor rauner to the illinois prisoner review board and it gives me an opportunity to go into a space where my son actually spent time as a, as an inmate and i get to go into this space and i and i meet with individuals who have uh on some level or another uh or i say allegedly uh violated their parole and they've been sent back to prison to come before the board to make a decision as to whether or not they go back to prison or they are they are uh, resumed uh to complete their parole uh time And I always say to those gentlemen, when they come to sit down before me, I say to them that my hope for you uh, in this experience that that we're getting ready to have together for the next 10, 15 minutes, however long it takes, is that you leave here with something that you did not have when you came, when you sat down. And I'm going to do my best to make that happen, whatever whatever that looks like, um, whether you get whether you get resumed or whether you get revoked. You are going to have this experience that is going to show you grace and it's going to show you love and it's going to show you kindness. Um, and so uh, my my message to the audience here uh, that is watching here is that my hope and my prayer is that after uh, listening to the people that have spoken their truths and have shared their pain and, 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 and been very, very transparent that you leave here uh, this evening was something that you did not have uh, at 659. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) What can you say to that? (laughs) Thank you. Can I drop that one? I don't know. (laughs) Okay, Lisa. (laughs) Uh, How do you do? I would have to say that to those who are watching, just, Give support, Very good. support yeah. these foundations, support um, boys, girls, the young ones that's coming up, just give them support, you know, and um, like a lot of these services that are provided um, here at PBMR have helped a lot of our boys and me as well. I've gotten a high school diploma through this program <laughs> and other services. And I'm so proud of myself. Thank you all so much. Sister Donna, Father Kelly. Oh, and Sister Janet, she's not in here. But um, yeah, support a lot of these foundations. They, they do help. I would like people to know that, um, especially young people who commit horrific acts that because you steal something doesn't mean you're makes you a thief forever because you somehow kill someone and you're not that you're not the act you're still a person and um my son eric has had you know he's had the benefit of of having us to go visit him and we've had the benefit of being able to do that because a lot of people can't but what i've 
come to find out, and I hope people do, is that when you think about people who are incarcerated, that you really think about them as people. Um, people who really have thoughts and dreams and, and could really make some, and, and we know that here, they can really make some great changes. And to just warehouse them, it doesn't honor, it doesn't honor their victims. Their victims deserve more than sitting someone in a cell and having them watch TV day after day. They owe something bigger to the world and to the community. And so, so many of them have that to give. And I, I'd like people to really just think that, think of them as human beings, really, as you're able to. Beautiful. Thank you, Julie. What I would like to give to the viewers out there is that, you know, never think that it cannot be yourself that goes yeah. through these type of um, situations. And if we don't better our community, it's just going to keep going and going and making it. I mean, this gun violence has to end. I mean, when is it going to be? We're going to be able to walk out there and, yeah. and feel safe. Yeah. Um, that's pretty much what I have to say. Very true. So these women have walked in some very difficult shoes. And I guess what I would want to leave the audience with is just to, as Brian Stevenson said in his book, Just Mercy, be proximate. So we'd really like to invite you to come to PBMR if you've not been here, or if you have been here, you know, I know the pandemic has sort of held people back and I understand that. But come and visit us. Uh, go on our website if you prefer not to come here or for any reason. Uh, we have lots of stories on our uh, website. Uh, also, in any way that you can support us financially, that's always a gift. And we need diapers. And so uh, someone just said, please ask the audience if they could bring us some diapers, <laughs> four to six. We've got plenty of threes. We need some four to sixes. And um, also, uh, you know, at Christmas time is coming, and what I've often heard from the women is like, it's so hard at Christmas. Thanksgiving and Christmas are very difficult for these women because there's someone missing at their table. And when they once said that to me, I was so struck by that to think in their home, their son is locked up for how many 24 years he's never at that table, or a son or daughter's life is taken and will never be at that table. And so, just to adopt a family at Christmas time and bring them some special joy. Uh, their siblings, their little children sometime um, would have love a gift from you. So that would also be a beautiful thing. So um, I would just like to uh, leave the evening asking you all to support our family forward in any way that you can. Uh, it's a wonderful program that uh, a team of us work hard that these families can move forward. All of PBMR works helping families move forward, either with jobs. And as Aldina said, she got her high school diploma this year, and we're so proud of that. Uh, many have received jobs. Uh, they have their own housing, some of them now. I actually, one of our women is now a lawyer. Another woman just got her doctorate um, in restorative justice. And so women are moving forward, families are moving forward, our youth are moving forward. And that's what we just hope and dream that through all of our work as staff and as participants, we all work together. We're a family. We're PBMR family and we work right. together. So um, we'll Amen. kind of close. Would you like to say one more thing? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we need money. <laughs> oh, <everybody. laughs> yeah. yes. To and, help uh, our organizations, right? Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. And uh, I would love every single listener to call their state senator okay. and their state rep and tell them you believe in second chances, that you believe you people deserve to be looked at and get a second chance to just be looked at and see if they're ready to join us in the world. That's, That's all you have to say. You believe in second chances. That's good. I do okay. believe in second chances and I believe in what she said. <laughs> Love you. Again, it's back to the funding because a lot of the moms, the young moms uh, need assistance with, I would say, rent, utilities, even mm -hmm. though you have LIHEAP, and CETA, but a lot don't qualify for that, you know, in the time 
that the bills may be due or they be behind because it's only like once a year, I believe. So yeah, it's definitely the funding. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sean Sweeney, some of you who are listening probably know Sean Sweeney. Sean Sweeney now is very critical with brain cancer, but she yeah. was such a strong supporter of uh, PBMR, of families moving forward, of all of our kitchens. I think she's pretty much established our kitchens. And uh, so um, we have, their family has set up a, a foundation called the Sean, uh, Sean Sweeney um, Fund. And so if any of you would like to contribute to that, that would also be a gift that would help our families to move forward. And so, um, mm -hmm. So we definitely want to continue these kinds of conversations. So uh, please be a part of Family Forward and PBMR. And we're going to close with a checkout. So I'm going to ask Lisa and go around the circle to say, how do I leave this circle tonight? Um, strong, strong-minded. I leave inspired. I'm leaving honored. exceptionally blessed very good and i'm feeling hopeful and i would ask lisa if you would close us out with a prayer please oh, gee. Thank may you. i did i put you on the spot I, I, absolutely no absolutely okay. absolutely that's praying is what i do father in the name of jesus we thank you for this opportunity to come together in love and fellowship oh god we ask that you continue to watch over this ministry, Lord, and the work that it does. Everyone here that enters the door and everyone that leaves, may they come into this space and leave with more than they came when they act, leave with more than they had when they came, oh God. Cover and protect with your peace and your mercy. I pray peace and blessings over the entirety of this body, God. In the mighty, majestic name of Jesus, we praise you. We praise you. Amen. 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 Join hands and say together. Amen. Amen. Women forward. Women forward. <laughs> forward, for sure. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Thank you. Yes. All right. Awesome.